last time we met, uh, not, not the rant, I mean last time we met, but might as well be the rant. Are there any questions before we transition to why we are here? Where are the others? No, it depends on the it depends on the problem actually. Um, there are certain instances when you might you might actually have a series of branch statements, right? Which are well, in fact the, the example we had last time. Um, the expectation would be that well, so it's, it probably would be a good idea for you to explicitly exit in the event that you don't take into account uh, like a required condition, for instance. If you, if you think about what we did last time, for instance, uh, the A plus, B plus, uh, and whatnot, you notice that any possible integer that you can think of is captured by those conditions. Do you understand what I mean? But the question you should be asking yourself is, what, what if none of the conditions are satisfied, right? What if there's an input value that is not satisfied by any you know, of the conditions? What do you do? You better have an explicit, uh, an, you better gracefully exit, I guess, for you to uh, not run into some logical error or something. So it's not mandatory, it's optional, it's, it depends on the problem, really. Um, do you have a specific example of we're waiting for the clock to tick 1,200 hours, but do you have any, any specific example, you know, stuff you were thinking about? Is this one of those awkward uh, classes where because of what happened, it's, it's always awkward, right? You know, you know how you, you know, something happens and then I just went through this with um, the fourth years that I was talking about last time, right? After we caught them, the, the, the meeting we had immediately after was one of those awkward meetings where uh, I was already too late, you know, I couldn't bail out, they couldn't find a, a different supervisor, so we were, we were stuck, right, just like you are stuck with me, right, and I'm stuck with you, there's nothing I can do here. But anyway, so if there are no questions, yeah, stuck. If there are no questions, uh, just a reminder here that we have an in-class quiz on Friday, so if you are thinking of skipping class, you better attend because uh, no take home here. Uh, now, I, th I thought I'd start, I can continue my rant here, right? I'm not satisfied with my rants here. Um, yesterday, right? Yesterday I, I, I got onto this, uh, because I cycled from home yesterday and had to quickly go somewhere. It was agent, so I got onto this Ulendo, Ulendo Taxi, right? It's a, it, it, I, I don't know if people have used Ulendo. I, I know I'm told Ulendo students are frequent users of Ulendo, right? This one is, so have you used Ulendo Taxi? Yes. Right, so the way it, it works, right? It's a, it's a taxi hailing app, so you, you install an app on your phone and then you, know, you specify where you are and then like a driver or a partner is matched with you and they come to pick you up. Now what happened yesterday was this man, right? I told him it was a round trip. I was supposed to go to my destination, quickly do my business, and then come back. So what does he do? He cheats. He cheats, and the way he, he decided to cheat is, uh, I get out and I tell him I'll just be a minute, he says, yeah, it's fine, I've canceled the trip. And you know what happens when you cancel the trip? The people that are responsible for the app don't get their commission. He stole, right, and I'm gonna report him. I'm, I'm not reporting him because, no, I'm not reporting him because I, I get to get a 50 quarter uh, from Mulendo, but, but I'm going to report him because it's the right thing to do. It is people like him that have turned this, this, this country, this republic into a terrible place. Liars and cheats. Cheating is wrong. If, if there's one thing that, listen, you can choose to disregard everything I've, 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 I've talked about in this, in, this, in this course from the time we, we first met, which was February 18th, but if there's one takeaway, one important key message I want to convey to you, 
do not attempt to do anything that is going to jeopardize your chances of graduating from this place. Graduating on time. Don't. I know it can be tempting, but don't do this. Right? There are certain people that won't really take this lightly. You know? and, and, and I also wanted to, to, to have a chat with you in case mom and dad or your guardians did not tell you that you are privileged to be here. I'm here to remind you of that. You're part of an elite group. Do you know how many people apply to be here? I mean, if you, if you go out there and look at the people that are holding these influential positions, they all come from here. What I'm trying to say is, once you leave this place, the vast majority of you are going to be holding very influential positions. You must be responsible. You, you don't want to turn into this person that, there's another case, right? Not too long ago, a colleague from you was just telling me, uh, uh, there's a person, right, a PhD holder, who literally was engaged in academic dishonesty. You know why? It starts from right here. At this stage, like clearly it, start, it, it started way earlier than this, right? We don't know how many people are genuinely you know, here or here because of you know, dubious means here. But, but please, stay away from anything that is, that is thing here. And, and, and I'm, again, I just wanted to reiterate the fact that I'm not, I'm not trying to discourage collaboration. Collaboration is fine. Form a study group, you go and study, and then you part ways. Everybody writes their individual Assign, assignment or assessment. It's not collaboration when you start making duplicate copies of the solution and then you submit it and pass it as, as your own. No, it's not. Right? This is the last time I'm talking about this, right? The rants are over. Okay, so we continue off with um, the remaining bit, I guess. Um, oh. Oh, I am recording. Okay. Yeah, so we looked at branches and what, and again, just to remind us that uh, our discussion of this is not really to learn how to program in assembly language, but to try and understand what's happening behind the scenes with regards to these instructions, right? And you know, I've already noticed that as we are transitioning here, we, we are compounding these individual instructions to, to, to build, I guess, more, more sophisticated uh, chunks of code, right? Uh, uh, for instance, what we did here, you notice that there's a whole series of instructions that we were combining for us to achieve this objective, right? Um, right, so something else that's um, routinely used when it comes to programming is this whole notion of loops, right? Um, and loops are nothing more than a series of instructions that are repeated, right? They're, they are repeatedly executed based on whether a particular or specified condition is satisfied, right? I mean, a whole bunch of uh, examples here. For instance, if I want to, uh, you can think of what I did uh, the last time I sent uh, an auto automated email with those ma masked names of yours, right? I don't know if you remember that. Uh, you, you, you all got, individualized uh, emails telling you to say, this is your code name, this is how you go and check your results or something, right? That spreadsheet. For, for someone to achieve that objective, you probably want to loop through the names or details of all of the students enrolled for this course. It wasn't manually done, right? It's an automated process. Of course, I mean, behind the scenes, I was just using MailMage, right? But you could view MailMage as, as being like a, some sort of feature within a software that does precisely that, looping through a series of items or input values. Why would you want to loop through them? Because you're trying to perform the same action on that or on those list of items, right? So you need a condition. So in my case, it's saying, read through this file. I have 60, 65 student details, read through this file, and for each student detail, send an email. After you're done looping through the 65 uh, students, stop, right? So loop condition. Um, sadly, the, we don't have like a, a core, core instruction right, or a bare instruction that is able to implement loops. And what this means is that we must, uh, at least in MIPS assembly, we must, we must, we must, uh, we must implement loops on our own, right? 
Yeah, so just uh, reiterating the whole notion of reputation here. Reputation, reputation, reputation. And we have examples here to try and explain what we're talking about. Hopefully people understand after that. Um, and really, when, when it comes to things like high-level programming languages, you notice that there's, there's usually a whole range of uh, looping constructs that you use. Uh, for those of us that have done some form of programming before, um, I guess we know that there's, there's this notion of while loops, uh, for loops, and do while loops, right? You're achieving the same objective, but in different kind of ways, right? Um, so while, 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 the student grade is, is greater than 22.5, print pass or something, right? You know. All right, so essentially, the so-called looping constructs have certain basic uh, elements associated with them, right? And so this, this, uh, this block diagram on the right here just uh, kind of show, show, shows you the basic elements here. Ideally, you, you need to have um, initialized values for you to implement a loop, right? So initial values that you start working with as you're uh, executing the loop itself. And then you need to specify a condition. A condition that must be satisfied for the loop itself to be executed, the loop body in this case. The instructions that are a part of that loop. Right? Condition. And then the loop body is essentially the series of instructions that end up being executed. Um, and we'll look at this in great detail here. So what, what you do is seeing as you're executing this, uh, you're executing this loop multiple times, before you execute the loop, you want to be able to check if the condition is satisfied. If the condition is satisfied, you execute the instructions that are a part of the loop body. If the condition is not satisfied, you exit the loop. Simple, right? Um, but also you realize that uh, because you need to repeatedly check this condition, because you have these initialized values that you're working with, there needs to be a way in which you need to modify these initialized values so that you, con you eventually converge to a sort of situation where you exit the loop body. Um, Right, and then in terms of MIPS, obviously, you need to kind of like implement this so-called reputation that we're talking about here. Right? You see that it's so simple. We actually, for the most part, you just use the branch and conditional branch, really. So, uh, initialize value somewhere here. You get into the uh, loop body. You check if the condition is satisfied. If it is satisfied, this is a Boolean expression, obviously. BGT, BLT. B E Q B N E, right? It, it must, this is something, an expression that must evaluate to true or false, right? So if, if it evaluates to true, which is yes, you execute the loop body. If it evaluates to no, you do not execute the loop body, you just jump and go to the next instruction that needs to be executed. So if, if it evaluates to yes, you execute the loop body, but what you do is you go back to check the condition. Right? You, you have initialized values that you modify, you go back and check the condition. Is the condition satisfied? If it is, you come back here, execute the body, modify the values, go back to the condition. You come back here until you get to a point where this thing evaluates to force, at which point you get out of the loop. Uh, logic, right? Simple stuff here. Uh, right, so in terms of MIPS, obviously, uh, branching condition, so uh, uh, so called unconditional and conditional branching can be used to, to check these conditions, right? So it could be checking if the value is greater than a certain predefined value, if it's less than that, or if it's equal to that, for instance. That would be a condition, right? If it's equal, you know that it's B, Q. If it's not equal, it's B and E. Um, if it's greater than B, G, T, right? Um, if it's less than B, L, T, right? I wonder if there's a part where you can use this L, T, right? Set if less than, I don't think so. Maybe, maybe not. Right, so again, the way that you, you kind of modify these initialized values, remember we said uh, the key things that you have here, condition, initialized values, loop body, right? So the way that you go about modifying the values, obviously, is you, for the most part, you make use of uh, arithmetic operators, right? So it could be that if you're looping through uh, integers that are increasing by one, all you do is every time you get into the loop, once you're done executing the instructions, as the last statement, 
you add one. And you notice really that uh, uh, when it comes to repetition, by repetition I mean how do you go back to, the, to check the condition, right? You execute the loop body, how do you go back to check the condition and conditional branching? Simple as this B, the name of the label that represents the stuff that is being repeatedly executed, the stuff that is a part of the loop body. Yes? You can. It turns out pretty really, that, in fact, if you, what he's asking is, because uh, I was saying you can implement repetition using an unconditional branch. So he's saying, can we use J instead of B? You can, right? One of the, one of the uh, differences cited in literature between B and, and J is the fact that with J, you can jump further, right? With a J formatted instruction, a jump instruction, for instance, you have how many bits you're working with to represent the address? 26, but with B, it's 16, right? So you achieve the same thing, but uh, I mean, obviously, you try it out, replace B with J, so it would work. So maybe just to try and exemplify things here, simple example, right? Uh, uh, and I, I sat there and I was thinking, we ran out of time because there was another rant, so um, we can do a live demo if you want to, but I put in things here to help. Um, so no live demo, but I've, I've actually uploaded uh, I've uploaded screencasts of these examples here. They're already on the on the playlist, the, the course playlist, the YouTube playlist, so you can go and see it afterwards if this won't make sense. I'm sure you'll be able to find other resources online. But here's here's an example, right? So we have a, 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 a problem here where, which requires us to print the first ten natural numbers. Simple program, right? Someone just asks you, print, write a program that's in, uh, using MIPS that's going to print the first 10 natural numbers. And by natural numbers here, yeah, the math majors here, we're starting from zero, right? So we're saying zero, one, two, three, or including 10, up to 10. How do we do that? You notice that without using loops, what you would have to do is <clears throat> have 10 statements, each printing the integer. You have a, a statement that uh, li, comma, v0, um, comma, I'm sorry, yeah, li, uh, li v0 comma one, right? And then you say, move the value uh, representing, it's, it's just. if there was no looping involved, what I'm saying is, for you to print the 10 natural numbers, zero up to 10, uh, you'd have to have these statements here. Probably at some stage, you just say put zero into eight and then move uh, into A zero eight, right? And then you do this again, you come here, you say uh, uh, load into eight, load one now, right? Once you load one into eight, do that. And then you come here behind the scenes here. People are praying for this to fail right? because it's been, uh, it's been very, it's been ranting a lot about a number of different things here. Um, not funny. <clears throat> okay. So what I was saying is that you, there's a series of steps that you can follow. So as a first step, you first of all identify the initial values that you're going to be working with. Right? Of course, the initial values you're going to be working with are dependent on the problem at hand, the problem you're attempting to solve. Um, and then you must identify the conditions that you're going to use, right? The condition, remember? Conditions. The thing that's going to be checking whether or not the loop must be executed or not. And then obviously you have to come up with some sort of implementation of the loop itself, right? So what series of instru instructions, I thought I did, what series of instructions must you include in the loop body? Um, and then obviously you need to think about how you're going to modify these uh, these initial conditions that you have in step one. Right? So what must you do to the initial value so that you, you, you evaluate the condition based on the next item that you wish to process? Um, and then you, re you repeat the, the loop body, right?
Right, so I mean, uh, same example here, I mean, this is a series of code that you might have here. Um, and this is what I was trying to say here. So what if you were asked to write first 1,000 natural numbers or first 2,000 natural numbers, how do you print them? If you, you probably have to write, copy paste uh, 10,000 times, right, if it's 10,000 numbers. Today is a bad day. Start, starting off things on a really bad note. I made changes to the slides, so um, it's going to be a lot easier if we explain things based on the um, the steps that I'm just from highlighting here. Just give me a second. I apologize again. If a user, uh, if a user types in, if a, if a user is, is entering a password, what you want to do is successively, ooh, what you want to do is successively check, what you want to do is successively check if the, uh, What you want to do is successfully check if the password is correct. If the password is not co correct, you're going into a loop, right? Prompt the user to enter the password again until the password is correct. In fact, sometimes it's like just loop three times, right? So when you're looping three times, you loop three times. Uh, if a, a user types in the wrong password three times, lock them out or something, right? Uh, if that makes sense. Is this making sense? Yeah, no. Horrible thing to do. I apologize again for the thing here. It's a... Finally. Okay, so back to our, our, our natural numbers example, right? Very easy to follow example here, but observe something here. And I want you to pay particular attention to the different steps that I'm talking about here. Um, <clears throat> so we're trying to, to implement a, pro a program that's gonna loop through t the first 10 natural numbers and print them successively. Like I said, the first thing you do is you identify the initial values. In our case, the initial values that we identify are two of them, zero and 10. Why is zero? Zero because we know that we wish to start printing natural numbers from zero. Natural numbers start from zero, right? So zero. One, two, three, four, all the way up to 10, right? The other initial value that we wish to work with is 10. Why 10? Because 10 is the last natural number that we wish to process. So in fact, we're going to use 10 here to sort of like um, implement the required condition for us to break out of the loop. Because the goal is to process what we need to process and then after we're done processing, we get out of the loop, right? We continue executing instructions that fall afterwards. Right, so step number two is we identify the conditions. Right, our condition is pretty simple because we know that we want to print zero, one, two, three, all the way up to 10. We know that we want to break out, break out of the loop when the natural number, the, the value of the natural number is greater than 10. Right, so you notice here that line number 10, we've implemented our condition, this is BGT, uh, whatever is going to be in register number eight, uh, compare it against success, compare it against what is in register nine. What is in register nine is ten here. So the first time you're executing the loop, you notice here the value of eight is going to be zero, right? So it'll be like VGT zero ten. Is zero greater than ten? No, it's not. So you don't go to this exit loop, right? You're going to continue processing these things. Here. Right? It's, a, the, the, uh, it's the reason why you need a condition there. And then you implement your loop body, and you notice that when you're implementing your loop body, right, it's, uh, it's nothing more than you coming up with a label that's going to represent the instructions that are uh, going to be a part of that loop body, right? And then within this uh, loop body itself, you include these other items here that we'll talk about, right? Usually, 
it's almost always the case that the first thing that you do is you must have your condition, right? As a first statement in your loop body. So you want, before you process anything, you want to check if the condition is satisfied. If the condition is satisfied, you process. If it is not satisfied, you, you go to the label that you've specified. In this case, once this condition is false or evaluates to false, we're gonna go to exit, right? Um, so condition and then you, you perform whatever processing needs to be done. In this case, our processing is pretty simple really. What are we doing? We are printing the first 10 natural numbers. And natural numbers are nothing more than integers. So because we are printing integers, every time we are processing an item, that is in that range, zero up to 10 here. We're saying we're going to print it because it's an integer, we print that integer, right? And what we're printing is what is in eight, right? Uh, so we print what is in eight, and in this case, we just had a, a, a bit of additional processing because we, we were also, um, we wanted to ele elegantly print the, the, the numbers. You know how by default, if we were to print the numbers by just using line 12 up to 14, you'd have uh, a situation where you'd, you'd end up printing uh, one, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But, but there is, the reason we came up with 16, the reason we have 16 and six, line 16 all the way up to 18 here is we wish to print them in, in, a, in a more readable manner like so, right? Um, and so we have like a, a courage return string in, uh, kind of specified somewhere up there which we print immediately after the integer which is represented by string one here. This is kind of processing, right? We'll walk through the code if you wish to. And then more importantly, right? You must modify the initial value so that you process the next item in the list. In this case, modifying it is just as simple as figuring out or coming up with an instruction that is going to enable you process the next natural number. We know that the next natural number is one value more than the previous, right? So when you're processing zero, the next natural number is one. The next natural number after that is two, three, four. So you notice that all you're doing uh, is modifying the, the initial value in such a way as add one to what's in register eight. So initially you have zero, once you add one to zero, you'll be working with one. Once you add one to one, you'll be working with two. Once you add one to two, you'll be working with three. All the way up to when you get to a stage where uh, after processing 10, you add one to 10, you will have 11. Observe, when you, when you, have, you come here, you have 11, you say B loop, you come here, BGT is 11 greater than 10. The answer is yes, at which point you exit. You go here, and then you'd have converged. You exit the loop, right? Um, I don't know if this is making sense. Um, so I deliberately included step number four here as part of the bullet points because uh, I guess trying to exemplify what happens here. Uh, so modifying the values is quite easy. Uh, I have, I think, about three examples here to showcase how you go about modifying the values, right? Um, to ensure that you continue iterating, and then eventually converge. What would happen if we didn't have, if we don't modify the values here? <clears throat> Do you notice what would happen? Yes? I think it would print the same numbers in, uh, as in dollar sign eight over and over again. Yeah, that, and that's the thing, right? It's, it's like you, you get into an infinite loop, right? So you, uh, look at this. If we did not have line number 20 here, The CPU executes this instruction, so the register eight has zero, register nine has 10. You get into this loop, right? You come here, you check, BGT, is zero greater than 10? Of course it's not. So what you do, you print, uh, you, 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 tell the, 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 you tell MIPS, uh, or QTSPM in this case, say you want to print an integer. Which integer? The integer in eight. At this point, the value in eight is zero, right? So you print zero, right? You print the courage return. Um, and then because this is not there, you come here, the CPU um, executes this instruction and realizes, oh, this guy wants to branch to loop, and where is loop? It's here. What you're doing is you're moving back to loop here. You come here, BGT, eight is still zero. Is zero greater than 10? Well, it's not. It's gonna execute this again. It comes here. So it to be like, you know, to continue doing this over and over again. This is what we mean by saying you must ensure that you converge, right? 
you process them in such a way that you eventually get out of this loop. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the jump and link, that would be like a procedure. Yeah, yeah that, that, would, that would be something to do. In fact, our discussion um, of procedures is immediately after this. So that's, that's another, another way of doing this. So you, you just implement like a procedure that would do a printing for you. Is that what you're suggesting, right? Yeah, that's another way of implementing. Yes, sir? Well, that's a good question, right? So he's saying, why, why do we have uh, this statement, right? Uh, like, why do we have eight and so? If we replace this with a, a zero here, think about this for a second. If this was zero, the value of eight will always be, please tell, tell us, yes. So you still be you'll be like in an infinite loop still. It will still be one. In fact, the only difference between the, the cancelling it out and including a dollar sign zero here is that uh, you probably get get to print uh, zero first and then one 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 one. It never stops, right? And usually when you go in an infinite loop and you probably discover this next year, by the way, when you get into an infinite loop eventually you run out of resources, right? Because the CPU is just continuously executing that thing over and over again. And the only way to, to overcome this is maybe you fire up task manager and then just um, end the program or just do a, a, a hard reset or something, just reboot the machine. Which is why you need to think about this. So we are doing this because we are interested in incrementing the value in eight. It has to increase somehow. Yes, sir. So how does it print on the console? Does it just print at once like all the same numbers? Maybe... We walk through the code. I have the complete code. I'll show you how it works just now. I was just explaining this. But it, so the implementation, the current implementation prints uh, them one line at a time. Uh, because we are printing the, the new line character here, uh, backslash n. Right? OK, and then repeating the body here, you notice is as easy as just uh, saying, uh, go back to this label, right? Loop. Right, just loop. This is how we are repeating the body. Repeating the execution of these instructions is just saying, as the last statement in the loop body, branch to the label of the loop itself. So it's like, go back to the label loop. Once you execute this, go back to the label loop. Once you execute it, go back, right? You're repeating and then just summing it all up here. So in terms of the complete, um, the complete code here, really, um, we can run it just to, to showcase uh, what actually happens here. So this is actual implementation. You notice that uh, I was saying that um, what we're doing is uh, different steps here. This is what we walked through. You initialize the values. Um, you implement the body here, but you notice that this, this new line character that we're printing is nothing more than just a carriage return, right? The, the character that's going to print um, after the integer is going to just print a new line, so you go to the next line. So if we execute this thing here, you will notice that it will print our, it will print our numbers like so, right? So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 19, right? If we did not have that new line character, uh, the, someone was asking why, why are we doing this? If we delete this, save this, and lo load and initialize here and run this, yeah, we're trying to avoid printing them like so, so that it's more, yeah. Yes. So, so all of these things are, are, are all of these things are, because what we are doing here is, if you look at 
what's happening in line number, hmm, observe what's happening in line number eight. This is where we get to specify which register we're working with, uh, where, which register is going to hold the numbers we're printing. Again, I want to draw attention to what's happening in uh, between line number 16 and 18, right? We are saying whatever is in eight, if the condition is satisfied, move it to A0 so that you print that particular integer. Again, observe what's happening in line number 25. After we print the integer, we are saying we want to work with the next natural number, which is, obvious. it's greater than one, right? So you just add one to the current natural number. And then, obviously, this, this, um, this number that we've added one to is going to be in register eight. So you're printing what is in register eight, as an example here. Is this making sense? Yeah. OK, so here's another simple example, right? What if we, we said we, we want to print, um, we want to add the first couple of even numbers that are less than or equal to 10. Right, so we want to add 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10, and figure out what the sum is. How do we do that with, um, with the loop? If there was no loop, well, I mean, we would have to, we'd have to print 0 and then 2, 4, 6 individually, right? Again, what if someone told you to say print even numbers that are less than 2,000, right? This is where loops come in handy. So we go through the same process, right? Where we identify the initial values that you're going to be working with. And then we identify the conditions that we'll be working with. And then we implement the loop body. Um, within the loop body, obviously, is where we're going to specify the conditions. Within the loop body, we have to continuously modify the initial values that we have, or the initial values that we have, so that we eventually get out of the loop, we break out of the loop. What else do we need to do? We need to uh, come up with a way of repeating the loop. And we know that repeating the loop is as simple as just a conditional branch, right? Branch to the name of the loop body. Again, the loop body is just represented by, by nothing more than uh, a label. A label is nothing more than an address in memory, right? <clears throat> so, initial conditions. Again, it's because we are working with the same numbers, we try not to confuse people here, 10 and zero are our initial conditions. Why zero? Because zero is the first even number that we start working with. And I've forgotten, I don't know if zero is an even number, but we don't know, right? Um, and then the last number that we're working with in the range is 10, right? So which is why we have 10 here. Uh, and really we have 10 here included because we only get to break out of the loop, we branch out of the loop, get out of the loop, once the value we are processing is greater than 10. Um, but you notice that we, we get to do a, a couple of uh, different things here, right? Uh, like for instance, and in this line number 13 in the revised example is actually part of the, <clears throat> it's part of the uh, initial values that we're working with. An even number by definition is a number which when divided by two results in zero. Right, I don't know how else you define that, but mathematically, um, that's how you define an even number, right? So if you look at our heuristic here, what we would have to do is, um, um, and we, we're simplif I don't know why we simplified this, right? We just, we, we, we're just saying we'll, we'll just uh, add two to the to the values that we're working with beginning zero, right? Because we know that when we add two, we get to the next even number. But another way of implementing this is you'd say, um, we just check to see if when we divide the number we're working with by two, if the answer is zero, then we know that it's an even number. Yeah? Okay, so in this case, um, zero and 10, right? Um, and then something else we're doing in, in line number eight here is we're saying we're going to define or specify another, another register that's going to hold the eventual sum that we're working with. Because remember, we want to add the first 10 even numbers, right? So we're adding 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. What is the answer? Right. 
So we start with zero because we know that uh, as we are processing the numbers, we'll start by adding whatever number we're processing to zero. Any number plus zero is that number, right? And then afterwards, you start adding the next even numbers here. So it will be zero plus two, you have a two. Two plus uh, four, you have a six, you know. <coughs> but <coughs> anyway, so what we're doing here is, um, as a first starting point in your loop, you implement your loop, what you do, uh, specify the condition here, right? Condition is similar to the previous one, you break out the loop when the value in the register eight is greater than 10, right? Um, and the way that you implement the loop here, you start with the condition here, um, and then you perform your processing, and our processing is, is quite simple, really. What we do is once we check our condition, we add the value that's going to, we add two to the value that's going to, sorry, we add uh, the value in eight to the register that is holding the sum. Sum is in 10. Whatever is in 10, add the even number that you're processing at that point in time. So the first time you have a zero here, you come here, you will check, is zero greater than 10? No, it's not. So what do you do? You say, oh, the, the sum which is in, in 10, which is zero here, add zero to that thing at which point the sum is zero, right? Because you've added zero to zero. And then afterwards, you modify the initial value by saying, uh, the, the, process the next even number. How do you get to the next even number? You add two. At which point the value in eight is going to be two. Afterwards, you say, repeat the loop body. At this point, the value of eight is two. Right, zero plus two. Yes. Is zero in register eight, another zero in register what? Yeah, because, because we're going to be, we are, we are using these, the values in these registers for two different things. The other register is going to hold the cumulative sum. The other register is going to hold the even number that you're processing at that point in time, which is why you need to separate them. And these are starting points. The, the, the initial values which are, are being modified as you're executing the loop, right? You notice if we work through this, maybe you understand here. So it's zero, right? Zero is zero greater than 10, no, it's not. You process this, uh, zero plus zero gives you zero, and then you, uh, uh, because eight has zero in there, when you add two to eight, you have two. So you'll be working with the value two. You, br you, 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 you go back to the loop here, at which point the value in eight is two. Is two greater than 10? No, it's not. So what do you do? You come here. At this point, you know that 10 is a zero, right? And because eight has a two here, it, it would be like you're adding two and zero. The answer is two, right? So 10 has two in there. And then you come here, you want to process the next even number, right? Eight has a two in here, two, two plus two is four, right? You come here, you check, is four greater than 10? No, it's not, right? You come here, you come here, at, at which point in 10 you had two, right? Um, and eight is four, so it's four plus two, which is six. Right? And then you add two to four, at which point eight has six. You repeat this, you come and check. Is six greater than 10? No, it's not. Right, you had a six in 10. Uh, you add six plus six is 12, right? Um, you come here, you have an eight. You come here, is eight greater than 10? No, it's not. Uh, 12 plus eight, 20, right? 12 plus eight is 20. You increment here, you're processing 10. Right, you come here, is 10 greater than 10? No, it's not, right? You come here, uh, uh, 10 has 20, um, and eight is a 10. 20 plus 10 is 30. <clears throat> and then you add two to 10, you have 12. You come back here, is 12 greater than 10? Yes, it is. You go to exit. At which point you would have had 30 as, was, as your sum, right? Yeah, zero plus two plus four plus six plus eight plus 10 should be 30. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Mm, okay. What happened? Where? How? Here's a question for you. What? 
what even numbers do we have between 0 and 10, including 10 itself? Let's list them. What's the first one? Followed by? What is the sum? Yeah. In register eight, we already oh, in register eight, in register ten, we already have a six. Then instead of adding a two, it's like we're adding eight. So that's what confused me saying how have we skipped from a six <sighs> instead of adding two to make it eight, we've now added Okay. Yes. We'll reuse we'll reuse oh, you understand? Does it, does everyone understand what we just did? Yeah, you're lying, right? <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. Here's this example written in a different kind of way. Right? We are working with register 8. 8 has even number, right? Hopefully this will make sense. And then we're also working with register 9. Register 9 has maximum number, which is 10, right? This will always be 10. In fact, we just say this is 10. 9 will always be 10. What else do we have? We have in register 10, we have a uh, sum. When we are looping, what we are doing is we are doing, uh, we are processing these things here. The first time we loop, because our initial condition is zero, the first time we loop, if you look at uh, our code here, we are saying, uh, and I think we should write it somewhere here so that we see this BGT. Uh, I don't know if this is going to make sense here. Do we have all the different elements we're working with? Yep, we do, right? <sighs> I'm trying to see, maybe we, maybe we should include all the different instructions. Maybe that will make sense. Probably not. The first time we're executing this loop, we have the value zero. When we, we, the the, when we, we're executing this uh, sequence of instructions, the first, time, the first thing we do is we check if the value in register eight uh, is zero, right? If the value in register eight is greater than, what is in 10, what, what, what is in nine? What is in nine is 10. BGT zero comma nine, true or false? What is in nine will still be 10. We've defined sum to be zero. At some stage we had an, I think we should write everything here so that people understand what's going on, hopefully. All the statements that we need, right? This is fine. Question, are we following with what we're doing here? The first time we're we are going into a loop, right? And we're going to loop through these numbers here, right? We'll probably include, a, we'll also include an 11 here so that people understand. The first number, even number we're processing is zero. These things we have here are part of our instructions that are here, right? BGT, add, add I, and then branch and conditional, right? Nothing fancy here. So we first of all uh, take note of the number in eight. 
which is zero, the first even number, right? And then we check, is zero greater than 10? Because nine has 10. No, it's false, right? No. We come here. What is in 10 is zero. What we do, what this statement does is, because 10 has zero, it will add zero and what is in eight? What is in eight? Zero. zero. So it will be zero plus zero, right? Zero. Which is the same as this, right? Um, it's some, the register 10 will still have zero in here. <clears throat> and then what do we do? We, we say, we, we modify the initial value so that we go to the next natural number. We add one to what is in eight. At this point, what is in eight is zero. Zero plus one is one. Two, sorry, thank you. Zero plus two is two, right? And then we branch and condition. When you branch and condition, we repeat what we just did here. We go through the same process. What is in eight will now be two. Is two greater than 10? No. Uh, the value in here is still going to be 10. And then we come here. What is in 10 is here, zero. So it would be zero plus what is in eight. Mm -hmm. So I'll just do that actually. We've done this with Edward, which is two, right? At this point, sum is two as well. And then what we do is we add whatever is in eight, we add two, right? Is it? We have a four. At this point, the value in eight is four. Is four greater than 10? No. What? Um, what is in nine is still going to be 10. What, what is in 10 is two. So we are going to add two and what is in eight. So it's two plus four. This is the same six. Could have dropped the formulas, but it's fine. And then we come here. What is in eight is four. To four, we add two. What is four plus two? We execute the next step. What is in eight is, we come here, is six greater than 10? No. Nine, we still have 10. We come here, the sum is six. So to six, we must add what is in eight. What is in eight? Six. So it will be six plus six, which is 12. This is the same, it's gonna be 12. To what is in eight, we add two. What is in eight is six. Six plus two is eight. At this point, what is in eight is eight. Is eight greater than 10? No. What is in nine is still gonna be 10. What is in 10 is 12 at this point in time. To what is in 10, we add what is in eight. What is in eight is? 12 plus eight is? This is, sum is just gonna be 20 still. At this point, what is in eight, we add two. What is in eight is eight. To eight, we add two, we get 10. We come here, eight has a value 10. Is 10 greater than 10? No. I don't know if that's a joke, but ha ha ha, it was funny. What is in, <laughs> register nine is still gonna be 10. Um, and then, to what is in 10, we add what is in eight. At this point, what is in eight is 10. And, and, and what our sum is 20. What is 20 plus 10? 30. This value is the same as the previous, it's 30. To what is in eight, we add two. What is in eight is 10. 10 plus two is 12. We go back to our loop. What is in eight is 12. Is 12 greater than 10? Yes. yes. And then we exit. Once we exit, at some stage, we print the sum. The sum we are printing is what is in 10. What is in 10 is 30. Which is the correct answer, really? Is that walkthrough any better than 
the code. Now, if you're looking for the code itself, this is it, the simple, and again, I just want to draw attention to what we are doing here, right? Um, we are trying to highlight the fact that for us to implement this, we have to make use of the bare instructions, the perhaps and pseudo instructions, the individual MIPS instructions. But if you were doing this just to showcase uh, what the machine has to do and what a programmer has to do, right, from a high level, if you were to do this in a high level programming language, instead of writing 33 or is it 32 lines of code, what you would have to do is something as simple as saying var uh, initial is equal to zero. Um, I just want to show you the elegance in this. And it's just a four i in range zero, 11 to uh, 1. Uh, we'll just go var sum. plus i. Hopefully this works. Uh, if I was working with the high, if this was a programmer doing this, a programmer would look at you and think, you must be high or something because I can do this in those series of code. And I come up with the same answer, 30, in seven lines of code. Right, so this, what I've done here, is equivalent of what the machine, what the machine does behind the scenes is this. And the reason it has to do this is it needs to process these things a chunk at a time. Hey, is this making sense? If it's making sense, uh, and if there are no questions, I'm going to ask that we think about, I guess I'll have to unschedule that, that thing. Think about this for a second, right? As homework, don't cheat and, and uh, go and look at the solution first, which is on YouTube, right? But hey, it's not examinable, so you might as well check. Like you're checking the answers before you answer, right? What is the answer? Um, the, the answer is right there. Uh, it's, um, there's this question here. It was meant to be an exercise in class. I thought we'd have enough time. How would we count, instead of summing up the even numbers, can we come up with MIPS instructions that will count the number of even numbers between a given range. So, if we're looking for even numbers between zero and 10, including 10, what we want to do is we want to count zero, two, four, six, eight, ten. 10. We must have the answer of six. If it was a range that is zero between 100, including 100, you count the number of even numbers. Can we do that? Yes, okay, I'll see you when you see me. Hopefully next time we meet, uh, the atmosphere won't be this gloomy, right? Uh, I remember when I was young and I, I messed up, uh, sometimes I would even refuse to eat, right? And emotional blackmail. To, my mother never fell for it, but my father did. Um, where you just remain, it's a treatment, that's what you're doing right now. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll see you on Friday. Quiz, in class quiz, right? In class quiz, Friday. Thank you very much. <laughs> These things are on the, the playlist on YouTube. I've recorded, I recorded them. Sorry? Everything we've done until the previous lecture. Everything we've done before this. The MIP stuff we did before this is what we are writing quiz on. In class quiz on Friday. Please come, come on time. If you are planning to miss class like I told the guys that were early, don't miss class because it's in class now. Um, thank you very much. See you when you see me. Great.